Greetings from Vienna. This is Charles Prince, the music director of the Plainfield Symphony, and welcome to my chat with Charles. Uh, this chat with Charles, of course, is a virtual chat for reasons that is, are obvious to all, and it's focusing on Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Uh, what better way to celebrate his 250th anniversary than with this virtual lecture and performance of one of the most iconic works of the classical repertoire. I will be presenting a lecture with examples of sections from each of the movements played by specific players of the Plainfield Symphony as, illustra as illustrations for what I will be discussing. Uh, at the end of this virtual lecture, Chat with Charles, you will hear a complete performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony with the Plainfield Symphony itself. So I wish you in German, viel Vergnügen, and we'll go right away to two places that are intimately associated with the creation and first performance of this Beethoven Fifth Symphony. <laughs> famous four-note grouping in all of music history. But why has this symphony become probably the most famous classical music symphony ever written? I won't be presumptuous enough to say I have the answers to these questions. Many have come before me, including my esteemed mentor and teacher, Leonard Bernstein, have explained everything about the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. But I hope in, these, in this video chat with Charles, I can present a little bit more in detail why this incredible masterwork is indeed a masterwork. And what better way to celebrate Beethoven's 250th anniversary than explicating, hopefully, the incredible artistry of his extraordinary Fifth Symphony. At the end of this chat with Charles, um, you, you will hear a full performance of the symphony performed by the extraordinary musicians of the Plainfield Symphony, a concert from a few years ago that I conducted. So hopefully everything I'm explaining to you now will make sense when you hear the entire piece in, in its continuity. I thought to begin this video chat with Charles, um, I go to two places that are of utmost importance for the creation of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Where I'm standing right now is in front of the building where Beethoven wrote the Fifth Symphony. It's called the Pasqualati House. It was owned by Baron Pasqualati for more than 100 years in his family. And Beethoven lived here off and on between 1804 and 1815. He wrote the Fourth, the Fifth, the Seventh Symphony, Fidelio, many string quartets, two or three piano concertos, all on the fourth floor of this building. Um, it's on a bastion, in German, the Mutha Bastai, which used to be a former fortification uh, when the Turks invaded Vienna in the 1690s. Uh, it's one of the oldest parts of the inner city of Vienna, and this is one of the 27 homes that Beethoven inhabited in the 10, 15 years or more that he was living in Vienna. Where I'm standing now is the, in front of the Theater an Divine. Uh, in this very building, Beethoven conducted the world premiere of the Fifth Symphony um, on December 22nd, 1808. Um, this concert lasted more than four hours. It was an Academy concert that Beethoven actually paid for. Um, in this concert were the world premieres of the Fifth Symphony, the Sixth Symphony, the Mass in C Major, the Choral Fantasy, and the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto, all in one evening. Uh, it did not go very well with the public, mainly because it was in the middle of winter, there was no heating, it was ice cold in the theater, and the orchestra was always complaining that there was not enough rehearsal time for this extraordinarily overblown concert. Anyway, this is indeed where Beethoven premiered, where the first Fifth Symphony was first performed, 
and Beethoven actually lived in this house from 1803 to 1804. Uh, the first movement's opening motive, this very, very famous uh, three Gs in an E flat, has become the most famous musical signature of any piece of music ever written. Indeed, the Allies during World War II used this most famous rhythm, da ba ba bum, one, two, three, one, uh, as Morse code to signal victory for the Allies on the D-Day landing day. Uh, this destiny motive in German called the Schicksal motif begins the piece with these three Gs and E flat, and then continues three Fs and a D natural. The irony of this is until this moment, we have no idea necessarily whether this is in C minor or E flat major. And we only find out for sure after this is the second bar, this is the third, fourth, and fifth bar. The sixth bar is the key clincher. finally are in the key of C minor. This is a revolutionary moment in music history because no one before Beethoven very ambiguously starts a piece where we don't know which key it's in. But this is the first time where indeed we have to wait six bars to find out that we're in the key of C minor, C minor as opposed to E flat major. This persistent rhythm is the glue that holds the entire movement together and is present every moment throughout the piece. Haydn used this, this technique of using one rhythmic idea through, to unify an entire symphony. And I think Beethoven, who was a student of Haydn, took this from his teacher. Uh, the word is very fancy, it's called monothematicism. The first theme is the theme we've just heard. The second theme uh, is presented first with a horn call. <laughs> And then presented officially the second theme of this traditional sonata form with the violins. This second theme is in the key of E flat major, um, and the strings, as I say, present this. Uh, the main motif is then taken over and ends the exposition, the beginning part of this movement, musical movement, in E flat major. The development section continues to use this famous motive, this rhythmic motive throughout the development, and manipula Beethoven manipulates in different keys, and finally fixates on a section of it that basically is very, very uh, obsessive, because we don't really know what key we're in. We're, what, what key we're in for most of this section in half notes where we're very ambiguously we go into D major and then we go from D major and then we're in this very ambiguous world and then three A flats and an F. And we're back in the recapitulation. The recapitulation begins um, as a normal recapitulation in the, in the key of C minor with a very interesting oboe theme cadenza This incredible oboe cadenza played by our extraordinary principal oboist Nancy Vanderslice, the bassoons announce the second theme.
The second theme, again, played by the strings. Um, Beethoven, interestingly, pivots uh, from C minor to C major in this section. And as opposed to, as opposed to going back, as opposed to going to E flat major, or going back to C minor. So the coda of this incredible first movement is Beethoven's very long attempt to firmly go back to the key of C minor. So much has written, written about the power and ingenuity of this movement. Um, it's extraordinary how Beethoven uses this, these three little notes, these three rhythmic ideas, these three eighth notes and a, and a quarter or half note, to unify an entire musical movement. Many composers after Beethoven use this in many of their musics and use the actual theme that we hear all the time in actual pieces they wrote from Schoenberg in his Ode to Napoleon to Ives in his Concord Sonata. Indeed, as Beethoven said, this could be, this rhythm could be fate knocking at the door for all humanity, and that's what he called it. Hopefully, in these difficult times, what better way to remind us that good will triumph over evil and that we will all overcome what we are now facing with this triumphant, fateful motive. <laughs>